Hello, friends, and welcome to a very special edition of your weekly Linux talk show. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. And my name is Brent. Hello, gentlemen, looking very snazzy for today's special edition. No doubt everyone out there has been waiting all year for this episode. It's the second annual Tuxies, as voted by our community. The votes have been coming in for weeks, and it is indeed time to reveal the results. So before we go any further, before we get into that, let's say time-appropriate greetings to our virtual lug. Hello, Mumble Room. Hello, Chris. Hello, Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I didn't want to bring down the show with a little bit of bad news, but I just want to get this done real quick, and then we'll get back to the tuxies. Um, I hate to say this, but I think we are going to postpone the January 2nd meetup. We're still going to go ahead with the moving lap. We're still going to have a big live event. We're going to have Brent and Wes in studio. We're going to go ahead with the server thing. But what I am going to do, just because the numbers are not looking good right now when it comes to the Omicron variant, is I'm going to punt the meetup until the end of January, which also happens to be my birthday. So we'll just have a birthday party here at the studio on January 30th, unless things are looking even worse. And I thought about this and I asked our get together group and, you know, everybody felt pretty comfortable coming. I don't I don't think anybody was really too concerned, but there are elements of this that feel a little bit like end of December 2019 early first couple of months of January 2020, where we didn't really know, but things just kept getting worse and worse. And I thought about it. And if somebody came here and they got sick while they were here, I would just feel really awful about that. You know, I mean, our audience means a lot to me and I I just don't want that to happen. So we'll play it safe for a little bit longer. And I feel so embarrassed about it because I've already punted this once, but I think it's just... So the way we have to just kind of be a little extra careful these last couple of years. So we, what we're going to do is we're going to have a big live event on January 2nd for the first LUP on a Sunday. We're going to launch the new server. And then on January 30th, which I believe is a Sunday at the end of the month, which will be just around the old birthday, where if I'm doing my math right, I think that's the big 4-0 for me. So it's going to be it's going to be a special event. So hopefully, hopefully we'll have fun. Hopefully things will be looking better. And it'll be safe. And, you know, just um, to make things a little less down, birthday presents are no longer strictly required for entry. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, there, there you go. Suggested, encouraged, but not required. No, no, no. Now everyone's off the hook. That's a great point. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, I think we'll still have a good event. We'll still be a lot of fun. We'll have things ready to go. In fact, in some ways, because we won't be launching the server, it, it means we actually have, when I thought about it, it means, okay, well, then that means we'll have more time to focus on, like, socializing and making food. Yeah, you don't want to see, like, stressed out LUP crew instead of the happy-go-lucky LUP crew. They're very different. But first, we must thank our sponsor, Linode. Linode.com slash unplugged. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And you go there to support the show. Linode is fast and reliable cloud hosting. I tell you that all the time. But a listener wrote into the show who's been listening for a while. He's been using Linux since 2014. And he wrote, I recently moved two of my brother's business websites from a large shared hosting provider to a Linode VPS in my region. My initial load page times for his WordPress site went from 10 to 11 seconds to 3 to maybe 500 milliseconds. After that, I moved my personal and work websites. (laughs) Website performance got better. But the big difference in speed was when I went to mount the web directories or SSH into them. Before, it was taking me three to four seconds on my previous provider. But now with Linode, it's like I'm connecting locally. (laughs) I know, right? What I love about Linode is when you jump on there and you go do an update. You know, you go do the old app get update or DNF update. It pulls down those updates faster than your SSH screen can really give you uh, the information. And the nice thing, too, is like I know Linode's all over this log4j vulnerability. They've been tweeting about it. They've been updating their post. Their security team has been watching it from day one, and uh, they're keeping people apprised. So if that's something you're concerned about right now with, uh, you know, your infrastructure, Linode's on it. They have fantastic customer service. They have the best customer service. They don't do that escalation thing. You call in, you got a problem, you got an email, a ticket, a social, or, or a call. They're going to stick with you until it's solved. And they're rolling out MVME PCI storage to a lot of their systems. So like the IOPS per gigabyte are just mind-blowing now because on their high-end CPU systems, they've also got AMD Epic processors. 
With 11 data centers around the world, you're going to find something close to you. A dashboard that's so straightforward, you're going to be impressed that somebody managed to engineer something so simple yet powerful. An API and a command line tool that really helps you take it to the next level in one-click deployments that can get you working on a project in just seconds. That's Linode in a nutshell. So go try it out. I've been telling you for a while. So why not take advantage of that $100? That's Linode saying, give it a real go. They're confident you're going to like it. And I am too. So go try it out. Linode.com slash unplugged. Get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And of course, you support the show. Linode.com slash unplugged. It's the second annual Linux Unplugged Tuxies, and this year we've had a tremendous response with over 1,500 unique respondents helping us determine the best of the best, your favorite Linux distro, the best desktop environment, the newcomer that impressed you, and the server distro that beat them all. And yes, the best open source service as voted by you. It is the 2021 Tuxies from the world's largest Linux podcast as voted by our community. Brace yourselves. Year two begins now. And we're going to start with our best newcomer project. This is probably the most controversial one, so we're going to get it out of the way right now. The best newcomer open source project, or the projects became well known in 2021. Last year it was WireGuard. Third place this year is going to Garuda Linux. How about that? Ooh, you know, it definitely... Had some good time on the show this year. I mean, you sort of sneakily dove in and revealed it to the world, and then I just had to follow suit, and I've still got it running here on at least one machine at home. And I would say we have heard from a pretty solid trickle of people after that episode that have been trying it. What's funny about it is it's like uh, everything's turned up to 11 with Garuda. The theme, the, the pre-config, like the patches, it's like Arch turned up to like full mode, like crazy mode, right? It's ultimate Arch, really. Yeah, it's funny because in some sense, it's like, it's like too much. It's not really the uh, customize everything stage of the Linux desktop that I'm, I'm really in right now. But at the same time, it did rekindle a lot of that spirit. And it's really pleasant to use. Yeah, it's fun. It, it's like when you just, you know, realize every now and then it's OK to have fun. You know, I have it set up on a machine and it's fun. And that's totally OK. OK, the second place winner for the best newcomer project. This was the only free form submission. So the, we got uh, a lot of submissions to this category, a lot. And then what we did, we extracted all of them. Wes did. He extracted all of them to a CSV file, parsed it all, got all of it. And then we did another refresh this morning to make sure we have the absolute latest numbers. And I am really impressed by our second place because I don't remember the timeline exactly but I'm pretty sure it came in around midpoint in the year at best. And our second place winner for the best newcomer project of 2021 is Quick MU from our buddy Wimpy. Can you believe it? Quick MU, second place. It makes a lot of sense. I find this super impressive. And I, I got to say, it brings a smile to me, I think because, you know, he's our friend and he always works hard and it's nice to get see him get some recognition. But also on a personal level, I've been using this so slick and it just makes me all fuzzy. I don't know if you guys have <laughs> spent much time with it, but it's just darn nice. That's true. It's come together really quick. You've seen a lot of support for it. The graphic environment's being created under Flutter. It took off on Hacker News. So congratulations to Quick MU. But the first place project, this is a this is impressive because we had, like I said, a lot of freeform submissions. NTFS3 from Paragon Software made it in the honorable mentions for this category. Silverblue and Kino Knight also got a lot of submissions. Yeah, really just a lot of Fedora in that regard. I mean, regular Fedora, some specific Fedora 35, but those immutable variants, a lot of love out there this year. Some love too for Asahi Linux and Alma Linux in there. A lot of people trying out Alma Linux this year. And Podman. Podman got a lot of mentions, and some people in the comments said they felt like Podman really came into its own this year. But none of them, none of them received as many votes as our first place winner for the best newcomer project of 2021, or the one that changed things for you in 2021. It goes to Pipewire. Pipewire is the best newcomer project of 2021 by a, by a big number, right? I think, Chris, maybe you were just like late at night voting on this one while people were sleeping. <laughs> it impresses me that such a, I don't know, seemingly specific tool like an audio 
um, subsystem is at the top of the list. Tell me, why is this possible? <laughs> you know, maybe in part because pulse audio issues were always a bit of a meme, and Pipewire is the solution to those problems for a lot of people. It seems to me like the Pipewire project doesn't really expect average Linux users to really know what's happening or care what's going on. Like, I don't think they realize the broad recognition the project is getting. This, but these votes, they show people recognize the work being done. Okay, I mean, part of it has got to be the fact that we're a little obsessed, right? I mean, we talk about the thing just about every chance we can get. But but no, I mean, just, you know, in our Matrix chat, in Telegram, I feel like we've, we've definitely seen folks who've, who have solved issues that they had with Pulse Audio just by adding Pipewire. Plus, okay, we've been following the Pipewire story. We've built it up. Everyone knows the, the complicated background of audio on Linux, right? So I think there's just a lot of community hope around Pipewire. And this year, well... With Fedora's help, like, Pipewire's in the hands of a lot more people. Well, thank you, Pipewire, for making our shows even better. And now we go from probably the most controversial category, because a lot of people, there was a broad spread there, to probably the category people are the most passionate about. And that, of course, believe it or not, is the text editor of the year. This is the one people always feel strongly about. And last year... Vim won. We'll start with third place this year. Nano came in at third place. Ooh, hiss. Oh, bias. What? Shh. Nano. My nano peeps are repping a second year in a row. I got you. I mean, I think that, okay, the noteworthy thing there are, all, all props to Nano. I'm glad it's useful for folks. Emacs has seriously fallen this year. I mean, like, Nano did not beat Emacs last time around, but Emacs was down at seven or eight, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well. Vim has fallen to second place. How about that? Did you ever think we'd see this? So here's the deal. Here's the way it works on the show. If a project wins two years in a row in a category, they go into the Hall of Fame. So if Vim had won Best Text Editor of the Year, it would be in the Hall of Fame. And it would, it's essentially enshrined forever as a, as a two-time winner. And then we vote on the remainders. It was a close one this year, that's for sure. It was. It was. So in a way, though, by them getting second place, it stays in the game for a little bit longer. So it does have a chance to be first place next year. But our first place winner for your favorite text editor of the year, I bet a lot of you are guessing it, it's VS Code. It's been a good year for VS Code. Um, It's wild to me that this is a Microsoft project that's at the top of our list. It was a very, very close. It was by just like, a couple of votes between Vim and VS Code. But it's, I think it's official. And I just got to sit with that for a moment. I've contributed to this. I didn't actually vote this year on the Tuxies, but I have been using VS Code all year long. Oh, dang it. I didn't vote either. I meant to, but... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't vote at all. <laughs> See, we, didn't, we did not impact the results. See, <laughs> But you're right. I mean, yeah, you've been using it. Uh, VS Code is my uh, day-to-day editor writing Python at work. I mean, I know, I know Alex is using it. Brent, are you using it? I'm using it via Alex. He's teaching me some things, and he said, you, you, must, you must use VS Code. You can't <laughs> use anything else for, for playing around. So I, I've gotten to um, maybe have it as an appetizer. Mm, okay. I would say uh, keep an eye out for the Tuxies next year if you disagree with these results. But in a, in a way, Vim not winning this year does keep it, keep it in the game. Of course, the spread here is, is huge and wide. Uh, my K Wright and Kate editors did not get the representation I thought they should this year. Unfortunately, I agree with you. Kate is my daily, daily everything. So I, I don't know, I don't know where it is. Come on, Kate, folks. I think it's just the people who have adopted VS Code are just really passionate about VS Code. If you're curious, though, take a look at those uh, Hector Martin live streams working on Asahi Linux because boy, he put he pushes he pushes Kate to the limit. I think Hector Martin, the guy that's supporting, well, him and the Asahi Linux team that's porting Linux to the M1, he makes, was, is it K-Rite or Kate that he uses, Wes? I'm sorry. I thought Kate, but we'll have to double check. But it's definitely a, a KDE text editor. Well, it's, it's basically unrecognizable when you see it because he's essentially turned it into an IDE. <laughs> that's what he's done. It's very impressive. So I don't think, that, I don't think those projects get enough attention, but I think right now uh, P- VS Code is, uh, is solving problems for people is what it is. And people are, you know, they're still adopting it. All right, let's move to one of my favorite categories. This is one I always look forward to, the best desktop distro for 2021. 
Last year, Fedora came in strong, as after a good, strong year of releases. So let's start with third place this year. Is anybody surprised? I think this sounds pretty reasonable. It's Pop! OS. Congratulations to Pop! OS. You guys got third place, and they've done a lot. You know, this was even after that Linus video, so hey, it could work. True, yeah. That's true. It didn't, uh, did not hurt them in the numbers when they, ha- when, uh, when they had the Steam issues. Now, our second place goes to OpenSUSE. What's interesting about that is that has shot way up in the charts. Wes, you might double check, but if uh, I, I seem to recall it performed fairly poorly. Like it was way down in the charts last year. And now OpenSUSE is in the number two position. Wow. Even above Ubuntu. And after we gave it a somewhat not so nice review earlier in the year. <laughs> I was wondering if there's a correlation between how our opinion of OpenSUSE has changed throughout the year and the voting near the end of the year. Just saying there might be maybe some influence there, I wonder. There could be, but this is desktop distro. And we've I've kind of all the whole time been like, I'm still not really sold on the desktop for SUSE, but it seems the audience is. I got to say, for my little dive into desktop OpenSUSE, I've been really loving it. And we've gotten a lot of feedback in the last few months of folks saying the exact same thing and giving us tips and tricks. So I could see how those who are listening uh, would definitely throw some votes in. Uh, I think there's a strong audience there. And I'm glad to see this, actually. Something tells me that in 2022, with us using ever more OpenSUSE on the server, we'll, we'll probably be Tron back in to play with the desktop a little bit here <laughs> and there as well. I suppose that could happen. All right, well, then let's reveal our first place winner, as voted by our audience. We had 200 votes last year, and I was hoping to get to about 800 votes this year just to grow the number a little bit to widen the base of selection. And this year we had 1,500 votes. So our community, this is got to, this is starting to get a pretty good representation size. So 1,500 people voted, and the number one best Linux distro for 2021 is Fedora. For a second year in a row, congratulations, the Fedora Project. This was a big win for you, and it also means you are now in the Tuxies Hall of Fame. We have our first Hall of Fame winner right here. It is Fedora, which means next year, the first place position is going to open up. Zeus could claim it, or something else might fill that spot. Arch got more votes than Ubuntu this year, though. What is going on for Ubuntu on the desktop? I think that's been one of our questions across the year. I don't know. We've got, um, you know, got a big LTS coming up. I guess we'll see what 2022 will bring. Hmm. That might change things. You're right. That LTS could be a big win. It does seem like Fedora had a great year. I mean, we almost were talking about it every other show that they were doing something kind of neat. Wasn't ButterFS by default included this year or am I? That was last year. I think that's what started kicking off. Well, that's what I think kicked off the win last year. And they've held that momentum this year. The, Mm -hmm. The notoriety they got for that, they've kind of built something into each release that is building on top of that. And I think they've done that really well. And we should point out this was not like a squeaker win to get into the Hall of Fame. Um, okay, second place, OpenSUSE had 11% of the votes with like 162 votes. Fedora had 46. That's 680 votes for oh Fedora. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, they won. Yeah, I know. It's a strong vote of confidence from our audience. And uh, I think that's telling that, you know, there's people out there recognizing the engineering work that's going into Fedora. SUSE also. Pretty interesting. And now Fedora in the Hall of Fame, that position opens up for others. So that is the desktop. And of course, we all know it's not uh, where Linux makes its bread or its butter. No, no, it does that in the server market. So this is the category that really hits Linux in the pocketbook. The best server distro as voted by our community for 2021. A lot's changed in this space, and last year, Ubuntu was our number one winner. Third place this year is Debian, not too surprising. But what is surprising, I feel like there's kind of an upset in the mix. A newcomer comes in for best server distro of 2021, first time on the list, Alma Linux. Congratulations, Alma Linux. Jack, I think the community is recognizing the hard work over there. Coming in at second place after just getting started, what, really at the beginning of the year? 
We've never seen this happen before. Yeah, I, I'm. <laughs> we're flattered. Uh, thanks so much to the community. Uh, we do everything for you, so I'm. I'm glad that uh, you know people like what we're doing. Absolutely, it's very impressive. Now we do have the first place to give away. This one I don't think is going to be too surprising because there's been a big shift in the market. People have moved around in response to the traditional CentOS release coming to an end. CentOS Stream got a very good showing, but it didn't get first place this year. But it does seem like people are really impressed with Stream. Now our first place winner for the best server distribution for 2021 is Ubuntu. Congratulations Ubuntu Project. This is your second year in a row that you win. But I think Ubuntu had an even better showing this year because the feedback was, I thought about switching to CentOS Stream. I thought about switching to this or that. And I just decided to go to Ubuntu. And I, when Red Hat announced the transition for CentOS, I came on the air and I said, nobody's going to go from a RHEL base to an Ubuntu base because of this change. It's just too much work. Well, apparently there's a lot of stubborn bastards out there in the audience because they've been making the switch this year and they showed up in the voting and it gave Ubuntu the win for the second year in a row for best server distro. Yeah, it's interesting that, that maybe it's um, a different track that has been followed on the desktop, you know? Uh, I'm not surprised that Ubuntu remains dominant here, but it, it seems like that's one area that Canonical has continued to invest in, right? Like, it feels much less stale on the server side than some of us might feel on the desktop. Yeah, I... I, I think that's it, Wes. Um, the Alma initial release, Alma Linux initial release was eight months ago. How about that? To get second place in eight months in the server distro market vote? Wow, that's super impressive. And to see Ubuntu capitalize on the situation as well, double down on what they do best and have it represent in our vote, I think is, it's also, it, you're right, Wes, it kind of underscores their focus, doesn't it? This is, this is where they're putting their attention. Well, it's that or um, people just run stuff in containers now and the server OS doesn't matter. <laughs> Maybe also that. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked about distros, but what about desktop environments? So it's the best desktop environment of 2021. I don't care what distro you're running on. What desktop was the MVP for you, our audience, this year? This is always interesting to watch the transitions. Last year, Gnome Shell won this category. Pretty interesting. I mean, I think you hear a lot of anti-gnome sentiment in the general, like, uh, chattering social layer of the Linux community. But when it comes down to people actually getting their work done, last year they said, well, at the end of the day, it's Gnome Shell. And that does represent in the default desktop environment for a lot of distros. The upset this year is the third place position. Coming out of nowhere, like a rocket, it's Cosmic. Cosmic. Not even a full-fledged desktop environment yet this year. Whoa. Isn't that something? It might show some of the excitement for what's going to come, I wonder. Yeah. Like people, sort of a vote of, we like this direction, I guess. Yeah, it's sort of um, closest in the, in the runnings with XFCE, but, but are those, those are opposites, I think. Yeah. So isn't that something, too? When you look at the numbers, XFCE and Mate are basically slugging it out in the numbers. And it's been that way for a little bit. It's... It seems to be that's sort of an area where people are kind of split. It's some There's an XFCE camp and there's a Mate camp. And so the numbers really get split between those two desktop environments. So the traditional desktop paradigm sort of has a split vote there. And that does change things a little bit. So that brings Cosmic up to third place. But I wonder, too, if there's not a split between Gnome Shell and Cosmic. Uh, one is born of the other. And so I'm curious if we have the numbers from last year's Gnome Shell ranking versus this year? Is it, has it lost a little despite still getting probably, I would imagine, good votes? Sure. Yeah. It was it was Gnome 40 this year, right? It was a big transition year for Gnome. I could see that reaction in some of the votes a little bit. And I, I would imagine, too, like you could see it change next year as people settle into the changes. That's going to be really interesting to watch. So Plasma came in at second place again this year. And I really thought it was going to win it this year. I thought Plasma would have it for sure because of these changes in the GTK GNOME ecosystem. I thought it was really going to be Plasma. And it, it does have a solid contingent that shows up and votes for it each year. And I do think that gap has closed a bit in 2021. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. It's getting... See, that's interesting. Let's talk about that because I think Plasma has been getting recognized in that chattering class a lot more. And if you look at the trends... 
it's possible Plasma could take first place, especially when you consider what our first place winner was this year. So, the best desktop environment of 2021, the MVP for our audience, as voted, is Gnome Shell. Gnome Shell wins it and enters the Hall of Fame. We've got a few Hall of Fame enters, enterers here. Congratulations, Gnome Shell, for entering the Hall of Fame. We uh, acknowledge your popularity and thank you for a fantastic year from the team and it opens up the possibilities for next year's tuxies as well <sighs> that's really something gnome shell you guys did it again i thought plasma would catch up to you this year but uh the gnome heads they still showed up for you see pressure's off now for 2022 so uh you can fix all the stuff maybe uh multi-threaded i don't know and then you know in a few years you can come back for another shot <laughs> oh my god you... no i'm kidding <laughs> brutal brutal all right okay we gotta we gotta uh move along maybe uh, get a little more meta here what was the largest impact in open source this year what project changed the universe for open source there was a wide range here to pick from. A lot's going on in our community. And last year, our audience voted the Linux kernel. Now, looking at the very, very, very fresh numbers, we have an interesting situation. So I'll tell you what got third place this year. WireGuard. WireGuard got third place this year. People are still very excited about WireGuard. Came out last year. But this was the year people implemented it. And I think this is the year it started changing people's workflow. And that showed up in the numbers and gave WireGuard a good showing into its second year. Yeah, right. I mean, like, not only can you just use it by itself, but there's projects that build on it, like TailScale, and even a whole bunch of commercial VPN services now offer it, just right along with OpenVPN. Now, we got a situation, you guys, because we've got a tie at the first place. Just, of course, we had to go get the most current numbers and screw this up, because we did have a clear winner. But I actually like it. So, initially, our first place winner for the open source project that had the biggest impact this year was Pipewire. Clearly our audience is very hyped about Pipewire because it's already won a category, <laughs> right? It got the best newcomer already. Yeah, in the most competitive category with uh, you know, a whole bunch of different entrants. Right, where things like the Linux kernel won last year, right? So we're talking, this is, this is a category. And so Pipewire was our winner, but when we check the votes right now as we go live, it is tied neck and neck, 26% between Pipewire and the winner for this category, Proton. 383 votes, 26% of the votes for Proton. Since we have a tie here and Pipewire run the last, won the last category, I say we give it to Proton in this category because this was a big year for Proton. Pretty much no question about that. It's really nice to see WireGuard and Pipewire on this list, that's great. But no doubt, Proton should be somewhere on this. And right before we went live, G-Hacks Tech News ran an article that says now 75% of the top 100 games on Steam now run on Linux. In fact, that's the top 1,000 games. If you zoom in at the top 100 games, it's actually 80%. Ironically, if you go to the top 10, it actually gets a little bit worse. It's down to 40%. But looking at the top 100 games, it's an 80% coverage now. And that is in big part because of Proton. That's today, right? That's right now as we record. The deck launches in just a few months. And I think Proton is an absolute linchpin for the deck, right? Like the deck wouldn't exist without Proton. And this could open up a whole new category for Valve. So unless you guys disagree, I think, I think we give it to Proton this year. No, it seems fitting, right? Like this sets things up as a category to watch for 2022 because, well, one, it's deserved now, but the next year, that's going to be the test. And it could either be an amazing Hall of Fame entry if things go well or a dramatic shakeup. Yeah. Or it may show up in the numbers next year as the deck because I would imagine the Steam Deck is going to be one of the entries that's going to be possible. So congratulations to Proton. You get the tiebreaker this year as voted by our hosts, and uh, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a good year for Proton next year as well. We have two more categories left, so let's do the second to last category now. This is a new one for the Tuxies. There is no last year winner because we decided to kick it off this year. 
It is the best hosted or self-hosted open source service of the year. Third place went to GitLab, which makes a lot of sense. That is an absolute winner of a tool. So third place goes to GitLab. Second place. Now, this doesn't have to be something you self-host. This could be something that you go subscribe to, but is powered by open source software. So second place went to the Matrix ecosystem and the Element chat app, which I totally agree with. First time they've showed up here. Congratulations to them. We've got a thriving Matrix community right now. Yeah, we sure do. And I mean, there's just a lot of developments and updates. And I'm, I'm sure if we went back a year, the Element and Matrix ecosystem experience would have been fairly different. And I'm sure a year from now, that will remain the same. You know, like it's going to see more improvements. It's going to be a better service, a better system. And hey, maybe we'll even have some new backend servers that perform a little better. Yeah, we might be on that, uh, that new one. We might be off Synapse by this time next year. All right. Well, we do have a first place winner. It was a very close call between Matrix and the Matrix ecosystem. So we did kind of make it broad. And our first place winner. But our first place winner did edge out just by a bit. So it's a fair win. Ladies and gentlemen, the best service of the year, as voted by our audience, Flathub. Flathub wins first place as one of the best services for the community. And I completely agree. This was the year that I started going to Flathub to discover what new apps are out for the Linux desktop. That's massive, man. That's a high water mark for me because that is a job I have been doing for 15 years, right? I've been looking for places to, that always give me the latest application updates. And I've switched over the years to different places as like my source. And Flathub is now one of them. And it, you know, it's great to see somebody collecting and getting adoption like that too. It's just so great. Well, and we've seen more and more, you know, app stores on various distributions and, and variants sort of tie in directly or automatically with Flathub or just make it simpler to do so. And I think for many of us, it's now, if not the default, one of the default ways that you're that you're acquiring software. You know, I load a new machine, I get Flatpak set up, I go over to Flathub and install some of the apps that I know that I just need by default. And it's always there. Like, I, okay, I don't have stats on this, but it works whenever I need it there. And I think it's nice to be a little grateful that there's, you know, this is a service being provided to us for free. I wonder if we'll see them monetize. That may be a hint at one of my future predictions, which is next week. But um, I think also for a lot of us, not obviously in Linux, there's never consensus 100%. But for a lot of us, it feels like flat packs really just kind of became the go-to solution for desktop software. I mean, maybe that kind of correlates with the Fedora adoption and Fedora trend. It just becomes so simple to install so many things like a lot of the crap stuff I have to have to interact with humans and do work stuff is just in flat packs now. And I'd actually prefer for some of those things to be <laughs> to be in a flat pack, if you know what I mean. Like Zoom, I'm looking at you. So uh, I think it's good to have Flatpak and Flathub, you know, as uh, connected to Flathub. I think it's nice to see that represented on this list. So I'm actually really glad they got this win. Which brings us to our last category. This is a special category. This is something we open up to the audience. You send in your recommendation to Uncle Brent's mailbag at linuxunplugged.com slash contact. He reaches in that mailbag and rifles through and gets a few honorable mentions for us. So, Brent, what do you got in your honorable mentions bag? Yeah, we got a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, we may not have been able to mention all of them, but I got to say, most of what we got in there were text editors, which <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're not surprised by, no. <laughs> but it just shows to me that there's such a love for where we spend our time writing maybe the simplest stuff uh, that ends up being quite strong for us. So one of the mentions was Fertility, which I hadn't heard of, but it's a terminal text editor that tries to be super intuitive. It says on their website, the main audience for Tilly is users who normally work in GUI environments, but sometimes require, require an editor for a console or terminal environment. So I thought of you right away, Chris, and myself, actually. I'm a huge Nano fan like you, only because I don't spend that much more time in any of the other ones than, and I don't necessarily want to. And you're a gentleman who recognizes quality and elegance. Well, thank so it's, you. Makes sense. So that was um, Philip that wrote in, and he suggested the following when he wrote in. I just love it, he says, not because it is the most efficient or anything, but Tildy looks and functions a lot like the old DOSedit.com. 
and it transports me back to when I was a kid and all our computers at home ran DOS. Somehow that makes me happy, he writes, and so I love using Tilde just because it makes me nostalgic and has become one of the first programs I always install when setting up a new Linux machine. I thought that was a really nice anecdote. That's a good angle too. Like if you connect with a piece of software that you like using, there's something about it that just like clicks with your monkey brain and just go with it. You know, just roll with that because then you're going to open that thing up. You're going to be more inclined to take notes. It just reduces friction a little bit. So I love it. So that was Tilde, T-I-L-D-E, right? Which is a terminal text editor. We've got a couple others, though. Uh, a couple other text editors, that is. Yeah. Um, we had Aiko and Robin write in suggesting micro text editor. Supposed to be a modern and intuitive terminal text editor. And I got to say, the sc- screenshots that I saw looked super nice. So I have not used it. Um, Wes, have you given this a try at all? No, you know, I've seen it floating around. I've not tried this one, but it does look pretty nice. And I'm glad to see support out there in the audience for it. Heck yeah. Perhaps I'll give it a try over the holidays. Glenn wrote in about CUDA text. So you got to give that one a try if you're a cross-platform person who likes to have a code editor written on an object Pascal. Okay. And then, uh, you know what? Sway. If this wasn't on our list, probably should have been. Uh, Joseph and Robin wrote that in. They're right. Sway should have been on there. That We should probably make sure that gets on there next year. A bit of a miss on our part, mm-hmm. I think. Huh? Mm-hmm. Also, we got some text in suggesting that for best distro, we missed something as well. Uh, we missed listing Nix OS. Robin said it should be on the list. They seem to have had a year of growth. Ah, uh, you know what? Let's give them an honorable mention right now because that's true. Nix OS gets an honorable mention in the Tuxies this year because they have had a great year. I've heard more people talking about them than ever. I feel like this is a, I don't know, greatest hits of... 2021 right you know it's a double album and we just get to sit back and enjoy the whole thing this is um i'm loving this i mean we used to like do recaps of the sh- of the year and stuff but then i realized this is way more fun <laughs> isn't it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and nix os is gonna have to be on the list next year also tim wrote in to let us know that uh next cloud wasn't on there even though we were doing the entire survey in next cloud right which actually turned out to work really good yeah that's kind of embarrassing um and you know, one of the great things about NextCloud is we hemmed and hawed about this because, like, well, we don't really want to make our NextCloud instance public. And then Wes was like, well, I could just go spin one up in, like, 30 seconds, and we just could do it because it's free software, right? And it takes no time on Linode. So we did just that. We just spun up a NextCloud for the Tuxies, and it was something that, you know, was safe and on its own island. And it's really nice for that kind of stuff. And for, you know, now we've been using it for over two years as our way of syncing our editing stuff and all of our clips and stuff between the hosts and the editors and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. honorable mention to the next cloud project as well, I say. What do you guys think? No, yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. Look, we've complained about it a fair amount and, and there are things that <laughs> you know that it could definitely still improve on. But at the same time it really has kind of become this background infrastructure. It doesn't take a huge cost to keep it up to date or maintain it or any issues on that side. And it has enabled the team to collaborate in in many real ways. Yeah. I kind of feel like the magic bullet there was using object storage on the back end, so that way we're not running out of disk space on the regular. Well done. Good choice. I got to say for myself personally, I, I, it's like the underpinning of my whole digital existence. It keeps me organized and keeps me connected to people, especially if you're trying to do the de-Google thing. It feels maybe like NextCloud has become a bit boring in the last year or two, only because they become stable and everything just works as expected. And I think that's actually a really good thing. Um, they've come out certainly with some features, but uh, for for me, it's just like, it just works these days. And that has, I was thinking about it. I, I think that's maybe mm-hmm. one of the pieces of software that's the most important for me in an everyday lifestyle, if I can put it that way. Wow. Well, then let's make it official. Honorable mention locked in. Next cloud. Thank you, guys. That's really, I, I agree. I'm glad we got those in. LinuxUnplugged.com slash contact if you have feedback about the Tuxies. We'll start collecting them. And really what we should do, and I, I meant to do it this year, but time always gets the better of me. Yeah, it's a gradual process to improve this. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to continue to refine it. So your feedback is appreciated. And then what, one of the things I'd love to do is put an early version of the list out and maybe get some you know feedback on it. We did workshop the list a little bit with the virtual lug. So we did get, we did run some passes over, but I'd like to do, a, you know, one with a general audience too. If that's, that requires that we're way ahead of the game, right? Because you think you got to start thinking about that kind of thing, like a solid couple of months before. 
but we're going to try. Yeah. End of summer, maybe we get started. <laughs> yeah, probably. Right. It actually also feels like a good problem to have that there's so many projects that we're sort of losing track of even some of the best ones. So I, I think that speaks volumes for the open source community. It's pretty great. Uh, also, I want to say thank you to our members on pluggedcore.com. Some of the best bits are the stuff that we stream live that don't make it in the final edit. It's just the way it goes. It's human nature. I, I If I could do one thing, it would be capture those things in just natively in a show. But what happens is when you stop recording, people relax. And uh, they know we're streaming, but they, it's just different when the disk space isn't being burned. And uh, that's what goes into the member feed. It's pretty great. You can support the show directly at unpluggedcore.com, or you can get a totally ad-free. It's still got all the great Joe production on it, but it's just 100% ad-free now. That's new. And uh, we've also launched a network-wide membership. So if you're already listening to a couple of shows, why not just get the membership? Because for right now, until the end of this year, for less than the cost of two show memberships, when you go to jupiter.party, you can sign up, support all the shows, and get access to all the special feeds from every single show, including this one. And it's the only way to get Linux Action News totally ad free so that is jupiter.party for that one and thank you everybody who's been signing up that's been really nice to see and i hope that uh as we add more content down the road you'll just get more and more value out of that but that does wrap up the 2021 tuxies don't forget our lup plug is every sunday and we'll be going on tuesdays details at linuxunplugcom slash mumble we have one more live tuesday it's our predictions and our results from this year. Join us for the last Tuesday, then we're moving to Sunday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. LinuxUnplugged.com for our links. Thanks so much for joining this week, and for one last time, we'll see you next Tuesday. Tuesday.